right? The way we perceive a person physically shapes our assumptions about that person. We do this all the time. We generate stories and beliefs about people simply because of their appearance. I know you did this to me when I moved here from New York. The amount of assumptions people made about me over the last two years is astronomical. And some of them are true, like, yes, I do miss pizza. <laughs> And some of you thought I was Jewish because of my hair and schnoz. And some of you still are really confused why I roll up my pants and the long hair and all that stuff. Listen, I'm having a quarter-life crisis. I'm going to be a dad soon. Please understand that. But seriously, all jokes aside, over time what happens? Once you get to know someone, once you humble yourself and you actually let the person speak for themselves, all those preconceived notions float away. And you realize that you were a little bit wrong about that person, and those views were kind of distorted. And they weren't actually as crazy as you thought they were. Unless you got to know me, and you still think I'm crazy, uh, but I digress. Once you get to know the person in, that, in your life, you get to like see that, man, you know what? I was wrong to make those assumptions. We learned this in elementary school, but this is still the human condition, even with adults. We do this with people, but if I'm gonna be honest here, I'm afraid we do this with Jesus too. Because 500 million people are more comfortable with the handsome European Jesus than the real look-alike Jesus. And I think this is a dilemma that can happen across the big C church, but most likely for you personally as well. I don't know what Jesus you're comfortable with today or what version you have of Jesus, but um, I think there's a few types of handsome Jesuses that I want to address here this morning. Maybe you like the Jesus that fits your needs. Maybe you like the Jesus that won't ask you to do too much, where you're okay with just the Jesus that wants you to show up on Sundays, to give him like 10 minutes in the morning with a devo, pray before you eat, and more like a side piece Jesus than actual Lord. Maybe that's the Jesus that you were taught to believe in, that all he wants from you is a sinner's prayer and time on Sundays. But then you see the real Jesus who calls you to take up your cross daily and deny yourself. That the one that calls people to sell everything they have to the poor and live a totally different radical lifestyle that starts with the invitation to follow me. You'd rather have the white European Jesus instead. Maybe you like the Jesus that votes and has the same worldview as you. You like the Jesus that says, we are not of this world so that you can hide from anything non-Christian and create your own bubble detached from the world because, hey, the rapture is coming anyway. But then you look at Jesus, the real Jesus, hanging out with sinners, being called a friend of sinners, eating and drinking with the least of these, being called a glutton and a drunkard, and making religious leaders of the day really upset. You don't like that, Jesus. You want your own version of Jesus. Maybe you think Jesus totally rocks with the American philosophy and culture that we're just swimming in. That it's whatever it takes to be successful, you do it. That Jesus wants you to be wealthy, healthy, and bigger than ever before. And your personal rights and liberties trump over any other rights. That when someone steals something for you, you take back what's yours. When someone disrespects your name, you make sure you get that back and get back at them harder. That life is about liberty and pursuit of happiness for you and your loved ones. But then you look at the real Jesus in his teachings on the Sermon of the Mount of loving your enemies, turning the other cheek, going two miles when they only ask you to go one, that the life he actually talked and he actually lived, you see there's some major differences and distinctions of what the reality of the kingdom is actually like, but you still would rather choose the Jesus you're comfortable with. And maybe... You like the Jesus that cares about injustice, advocating for the poor and the most vulnerable in society, that you care about the injustices of the world and helping the least of these, but you don't like the Jesus that calls you into a holy lifestyle, remind renewed by the scriptures and to be pure at heart and in lifestyle. And so what should we do? We got all these different versions of Jesus, all these images of Jesus. How do we get to see the real one? How do we get a better vision of who Jesus is with all the fake ones that we can make up in our own minds? Well, just like in any relationship with a person, we have to come and we have to humble ourselves. And we have to realize that we come with some assumptions of who Jesus is, no matter if you've been following Jesus for a really long time or trying to figure this out. We all come with our mixed bag of assumptions, things, things we assume about Jesus that could be totally off, maybe half-truths, and we might think we know what he's about, but we could totally miss it. And there's a humbling that needs to take place, and if we don't humble ourselves and allow Jesus to challenge, the real Jesus, to challenge our assumptions about him, we won't see him clearly. And I'm talking to everybody today. 
You might be thinking like, oh, Anthony is about to do a message for this group of people. No, I'm talking about everybody. Because I want you to let you know something. There's a truth that we can actually remain blind as followers of Jesus to who he actually is. That we can grow up in church, we can grow up being a Christian, read the Bible for years and remain totally blind to who Jesus actually is. How do I know this? I just see it in me. And then I see it with other people that I know. But even more so, what the crazier thing is, that this is a problem from the very beginning of the Jesus movement. (laughs) That the people who were close to Jesus, God in flesh, the word became flesh, had these blinders on to who Jesus actually was. You know, if I traveled 2,000 years ago, I feel like I would really know who Jesus was. If I lived with him, if I ate with him, if I was one of his disciples, I feel like I would know what he was about. How foolish am I? And there's this fascinating story in the Gospel of Luke that speaks to this core issue of dudes who follow Jesus for years, hearing his teachings, watching him perform miracles, ended up completely missing who he was and what he was trying to do. And the truth is we can too today. And our job as apprentices or disciples of Jesus under him is to really daily try to sharpen our minds around the reality of Jesus and who he is. And if you're not a follower of Jesus today, and I just want you to welcome you (laughs) if you're trying to figure this whole faith thing out. And I just want to let you know that Christians oftentimes miss who Jesus actually is. And sometimes you can call it out in us better than we can even see it. I'm just going to be honest. And I don't care if they've been a, a leader in some sort of church. People miss who Jesus is all the time. So if you're coming with baggage of Christianity and Jesus, I want to you to know that you're welcomed here to wrestle all that out. Because my job... In my attempt, in my humanity, in my trying to figure this thing out, in my human condition, I'm going to try to point you to the real Jesus. Because maybe if you see the real Jesus, not maybe other Christians or what you think is who you think Jesus is, you will be so compelled. And you would want to follow him for the rest of your life. And so I want to jump into this fascinating story. And it's Luke chapter 24. So if you have a Bible, you can turn there. Um, We're at Luke chapter 24, but before we get started in there, you could keep flipping to that or turn it on, whatever you do. I want to first kind of give the context of what's going on, because we're going to be jumping into like a middle of a movie or towards the end of a movie, actually, and I want to just kind of give you the context before we dive into it, because it's really important. So imagine with me for a moment that you meet this man named Jesus of Nazareth, and people claim that he is... Of the Messiah. So you sell half your possessions just to follow this guy, and you follow him at this time to a Jewish festival called Passover. And it's the biggest, most important Jewish holiday and of the year. And you believe that it's all going to hit the fan as Jesus walks into Jerusalem. What do I mean? Because Jesus was claiming forth that he was bringing forth the kingdom of God. He said it's right here at the door. And what, which in the disciples' minds, This meant that Jesus was going to go in, take over the empire of the day, and bring peace and restoration for the Jewish people. But what happens in this story is totally earth-shattering. Because instead of conquering the enemy, what happens? Jesus gets publicly humiliated. He gets up on a cross. The people, his disciples, his homies, were expecting him to take over. Instead, the enemy takes over him. And this was a totally earth-shattering experience, and this didn't fit any of the disciples' categories. So a lot of them scramble, a lot of them run away, and they just are like, I don't know what to do. And then, but the crazy thing is, there's claims from women, these women, that like, hey, listen, Jesus is actually risen from the dead, and the disciples were really confused. But then we get two disciples that are just like, you know what, I'm packing up my bags, this whole Jesus thing was a scam, I'm going home. So that's where we are in verse 13. And this is where the story picks up. The verses are going to be on the screens for you to follow along. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had just happened, everything that I just described a moment ago. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But, circle this, their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Their eyes were kept from recognizing him. This is so good. So everything that just happened, 
These men followed this guy for three years. He saw, they saw Jesus heal the sick, teach with authority, and these disciples were convinced this was the dude, and then everything turned sideways, and all of a sudden, these disciples, thinking that it's all over, meet the risen Jesus. But do they see Jesus? Let's look at 16. I love how the ESV puts it. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Do they see Jesus? Do they see this person? <laughs> Yeah, but do they see Jesus? Do they know that it's Jesus? No. So they can see Jesus, but they actually can't see. Do you get why this story is so powerful? This story is about being a follower of Jesus, but not actually knowing who he is. This story is about being a follower of Jesus, seeing, living under him for three years, but actually not knowing who he is. Let's continue as the story goes on. Verse 17 says this, and he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? This is Jesus talking. <laughs> and I, I just have to believe there's some irony that's going on. Like, of course Jesus like, knows what they're talking about. Everything happened because of Jesus. I just feel like if you read it, I don't know, I might be adding into that, but I think it's going on. Let's continue. Look, and they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor of Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there, there in these days? And he said to them, what things? I mean, come on. Jesus is, Jesus is messing with them. Come on, right? You see it? No? All right. Um, and, then, and then they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, the guy who's standing right there. All right, whatever. Um, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. Just explaining what just happened. But listen really closely in verse 21. And it says this. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. But we had hoped that he was going to be the one to redeem Israel, our people. There it is. The disciples just showed their cards. They explo exposed their blinders. Seeing Jesus being hung on a cross Shattered everything they hoped for. They had their uh, Warner Solomon Jesus. And their Warner Solomon Jesus, their good looking white European Jesus, was supposed to be this king, a conquering king. But who's the real Jesus? A crucified king. That's the real picture. And so we clearly see the disciples' version of Jesus, the good looking warrior one, and they don't believe that Jesus redeemed Israel. Right? They're walking away sad, not happy. And in their minds, Jesus did not do his job. But does Jesus think he redeemed Israel on the cross and rising from the dead? And this is the tension I want to face with and I want to explore for a little bit. And for Jesus and his disciples, it really just comes down to the wrong definition of that word redeemed. And if you're highlighter, highlighting, you'd like to take notes, highlight that word redeemed. Because what does this word redeemed mean? What does this word redemption mean? And because it also, what is that connotation? What does that word bring? What is the stories? What are the things that come up when you hear the word redeemed? Because for the disciples and Jesus, they were both Jewish. So they lived under the scripture. So they had the same resources, the same source. But for two different conclusions going on with the word redeemed. And you could be a follower of Jesus and know the Bible and know the Old Testament and know the stories. But you could have some wrong definitions as well, clearly. So I'm going to go back to the first time this word is used. I want to go back to what they think redeeming is all about. And I think once we get there, we'll get to see them even more what's going on. And so fun Bible trivia fact, if you want to, you can use this at parties if you want. I want to ask you, uh, when do you think the first time the word redeemed is used in the Bible? Just shout it out if you know it. It's okay if you don't, but listen, you'll be a big hit at parties if I, if once you know this. So anybody know? It's okay. I didn't know either. First time was in Exodus. Exodus chapter six is the first time this word is penned in the scriptures. So it's gonna be on the screens. You don't have to turn to it, but verse five, um, chapter six says this. This is Yahweh speaking, the Lord speaking. More over, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. So real quick, Egyptians hold as slaves. These people were um, held as slaves by Egypt. 
But God's saying, look, I know my covenant. And his covenant, his promise was to get this group of people and make them a blessing to the rest of the world. That's what he's talking about. And so he goes on and says this. So therefore, to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will deliver you from slavery to them. And I will, everybody say it together, redeem you with an outstretched arm and with acts of judgment. So there it is. This is the story that the disciples and Jesus immerse themselves into. And it's the Exodus story where God, who is faithful to his covenant promise that he made to this people, rescues his people from the oppressive Egyptian empire and frees them to be his people. So from the story, what's a good definition of the word redemption? Well, it looks like to me that redemption means the purchase of slaves out of an oppressive empire, right? I mean, that's my definition from the story and the whole Exodus story. But that's the idea. And so stick with me. I don't want to lose you. This is so powerful. Just look at the parallels from the Exodus story and what happened with Jesus. And it might make, it might make some sense why the disciples were so confused on what happened. 